uh, from New York. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Since our last show, two more women have accused Governor Andrew Cuomo of inappropriate behavior, including sexual harassment. And now a small but growing number of Democrats are calling on him to resign. But for now, that doesn't look likely. Most Democrats say they want to wait for the state AG's office to investigate the claims before making any big moves. And Cuomo said this week he's not going anywhere. Uh, I'm not going to resign. Uh, I work for the people of the state of New York. They elected me, and I'm going to serve the people of the state of New York. And by the way, we have a full plate. We have COVID. We have recovery. We have rebuilding. We have a teetering New York City. Republicans, meanwhile, want Cuomo to step down immediately, and that's partly because of where things stand right now with the legislature, which is led by Democrats. Cuomo has until the end of March to negotiate a $190 billion state budget with lawmakers, and Republicans don't think he can do it while facing multiple investigations. You'll remember he's also under investigation for the state's handling of nursing homes. Here's Senate Republican leader Rob Ort. Look, I, I think that these allegations are incredibly damning. Uh, the scandals are incredibly damning. He's got two investigations. It actually goes back to my point that I said, how can someone continue to do the job that we expect the governor to do amidst all these distractions. Let's break it all down with Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio and Anna Gronwald from Politico. Thank you both for being here. Sure thing. Thanks. Karen, is the governor going to resign? Well, he said on Wednesday that he was not going to resign, and he seemed pretty adamant about that. And I think he did certainly buy himself some time by what he said on Wednesday, his kind of apology, non-apology, where I'm sorry that I made people uncomfortable, but I didn't mean it. Um, so I think he's going to try to stick it out. But really, any other politician that I've covered in many years that's been in a similar situation, they've resigned by now. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely different uncharted territory. This has been going on since the first uh, woman came forward with details, Lindsay Boyland. It's been going on a week and a half, which seems like an eternity. Isn't that long in time, but usually within a few days, somebody is gone. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch how long because he's really lost control of the narrative at this point. I'm really curious about how things are in Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul's office right now. Because, and I was just thinking about this. Uh, I read David Patterson's recent book about his whole time in politics, and there was this whole part about how he was told he was going to be ascending to the governorship. I'm wondering if those conversations have happened. Obviously, we don't know, but that's just something on my mind. Uh, let's turn to I the, don't think they are at this yeah, point. I don't that's think they are say. either, but like, I'm just curious, what, what's in Kathy Hochul's head right now? Is she preparing to ascend to the governorship? Who knows? Well, we don't know because she has been, she's gone radio silent. Yes, she's been very quiet. Well, about and this I as think well. certainly there would be so mm -hmm. many things that in that scenario she would have to handle that she hasn't been a part of over the past year. Right. And so there's a, there is a place for her to step into that she would be very qualified to do, but it seems like Cuomo has really left her out of pandemic response, of even the budget process. And so she would be jumping into a lot of, uh, places that she hasn't necessarily had the spot to before. She'd also be going to a health department where the nine top epidemiologists and infectious disease experts have left over the last year over arguments with uh, the Cuomo's top aides over how to handle the pandemic. So she wouldn't even be able to step in and say, okay, I have all these experts, give me your advice, let's go. No, it is concerning. The governor and five of his top aides, it seems, are like running the state right now. So it makes it it makes it hard for him to leave even under these circumstances. And it makes you wonder as well, with those top aides running everything, the governor's inner circle is so tight, especially since his other top aide, Joe Percoco, was accused of federal charges and is now in prison. He's really just shrunk that circle, so he has a very small number of people who are very close to him. And it's shrinking a little bit this exactly. week with one of his top aides, Gareth Rhodes, going back to one of the agencies and the... the uh, top female uh, press aide. She said the job was in the works, but she's leaving too. So that circle could shrink right. as, as this, this goes on. Exactly. Also this week, Thursday evening and Friday morning, Charlotte Bennett, the second accuser of the governor, gave an interview to CBS News, some um, very graphic details of her conversations with the governor. Anna, what did you think about that interview? Do you think it pushes things a little bit further towards uh, trouble for the governor, or do you think it, things kind of stay where they are? Well, it is the first time that one of the women has gone live with kind of a back and forth. Um, and in a very public, widespread way, she, I think, 
uh, there wasn't a lot of reason when you when you saw her and when you heard what she said, there wasn't a lot of reason to doubt any of that. Um, and she, I think, didn't say anything necessarily that we didn't expect or we hadn't heard from her or her lawyers. Uh, but juxtaposing her um, on TV last night and this morning with the apology we saw from the governor, if you did sort of a split screen, um, I think that there would there would be uh, not a lot of reason not to believe what Charlotte said. Also, right. CBS is, is uh, playing it out over three news cycles, Thursday night, Friday morning, Friday night. So that keeps drilling it in. And yeah, it, I thought it was a devastating interview. She was very compelling. There's a, it would be, it's hard not to believe her that she would just make up this whole thing and make this act. I'm not saying, I mean, you know, we have to wait till the attorney general's report comes out to find out the truth, but she's very compelling. She makes a good case for an older boss kind of grooming her to be, you know, eventually, essentially his sex partner, trying to find out her vulnerability. She's a victim of sexual abuse and she has made that public and she said that he kind of probed her about that to see if she had any insecurities or weaknesses that, you know, essentially he could prey on. I mean, that's that's her account, which I found that part very chilling. And I think that, that will be what's interesting. We don't know exactly how the attorney general is going to go about this report, but those are the sorts of things. What, what are they looking for? And she, how can you put in a report um, something that she is dead set on saying that she believes and that she felt and what the governor's intent was. You know, I don't, I don't know what other allegations might come out, but that's a very tricky thing to investigate. Yeah, I, no, I, I agree. I should say that we're taping on Friday morning. Mm -hmm. So if by the time this airs at your PBS station and the governor has resigned, I'm not gonna be offended if you change the channel. <laughs> I hope that you stay with us, but I understand. Uh, yeah, Karen, it could how- happen. I just, I just wanted to mention one more thing that Charlotte Bennett said that yeah. was, I thought, very compelling. She said, he's a textbook abuser who let his temper rule the office. And the sexual harassment charges aside, I, I think that statement would ring true with a lot of people Absolutely. with stories that we have heard and some of us have maybe witnessed firsthand. Before we run out of time, and I know that this Sorry is an incredibly <laughs> important topic, but I want to switch very quickly to the nursing homes. The, the Times and the Wall Street Journal had a story on Thursday night overnight about this controversial report that was issued by the Department of Health over the summer. I think it was issued in June or early July, one of the two, that basically tried to frame the nursing homes, the deaths in nursing homes from COVID as a result of asymptomatic visitors and staff. And we now know, due to their reporting, that a couple of top aides of the governor actually went into that report and before it was published, took out the number of nursing home residents that died after they were transferred to the hospital, which is just something that we've been talking about forever now. Um, and I wanna go to you, how are people reacting to this? It, it seems like a very big thing in, in some respects. I think in the way that we hadn't seen those numbers and that the, the numbers that came out more recently were different, I think that's what we all suspected. Yes. Um, that's kind of the conclusion we had drawn. But to have uh, real reporting, actual proof that that's what happened is, um, I think that's, that's devastating if we move back to the different scandal before the one that we were mm -hmm. working on this week. Um, I think the, the administration has said that those weren't finalized, those weren't something they could verify at the time, and so that's why they didn't include them. But um, they were, at that point, the numbers had been um, something that were being asked for for so long that it, it's surprising that, that those weren't verified and that those weren't something that they could say definitively they wanted in or not. It just makes it look more and more like a cover-up because they said, well, the numbers weren't verified, so we took them out, and they apparently argued with the health department staff, many of those who are, are gone now. And it just seems like, you know, it just, it just doesn't look good, good for them that they have one excuse after another. Later on, they said it was the Department of Justice inquiry that they couldn't reveal the numbers because they were afraid of their uh, investigation. So there's just a number of excuses and it just shows once again, it just seems like the cover up always ends up being worse than the crime. If they had just said, well, yeah, there were a lot of nursing home deaths in hospitals. It's a terrible thing. We're looking into it. If they had said that last June, like I don't think any of this would be happening right now. Karen, last word, we have a few seconds left. How are lawmakers reacting to all of this right now? Well, they're poised right now to take away the governor's emergency pandemic powers with some caveats. Other than that, they seem to be waiting and watching and hoping they can somehow get a budget done with this guy with all this going on. <laughs> 
Well, it's going to be tough, but we'll see. It's, gonna, it's due by the end of March, so they have a few days, but we'll see. Anna mm -hmm. Gronwald from Politico, Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio. Thank you both, as always. Thank you.